Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I'll make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them. And from the cloud a voice said, This is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome with fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up and do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, Tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. So please be seated. <coughs> When I reached my maturity at the age of 10 and filled with heavenly wisdom, I informed my parents there's no such thing as God and that I had nothing, no truck with any of that and didn't wish to be involved with anything to do with church. And so they respected my wise wishes and I was not compelled to attend anything to do with church thereafter. Anyway, um, my teenage years were not that great. Um, I had epilepsy. As my uh, professor Sawney in Morriston put it, it was hard to diagnose and hard to treat, in that no one could work out why I was getting these fits, and no one could work out what to do about it. So I tried a series of medications, each one more toxic than the last, and the standard way of kind of um, trying out meds for epilepsy is you see if one works, you increase the dosage until it becomes a real problem in itself, and then when it becomes basically toxic, <laughs> when you're starting to poison the patient, then you think, oh, this isn't working, let's try another one. But you can't just stop taking them because the <coughs> reaction from taking meds for epilepsy is that you have a fit. So in other words, if I doped any of you with meds for epilepsy and then you just stop taking them, you'd have a fit. That's the withdrawal reaction. So one has to phase them out very, very gradually. So it takes about six months to a year to come off a particular med. And then it takes another year or so to get onto a different one. So you can imagine the whole process is a very, very kind of long-winded, slow, convoluted thing. And it was a wretched business. It was horrible. I had a lousy time as a teenager. Anyway, when I was about 18, I really wanted to kind of pull myself together. I thought, I've got to move on. I can't carry on like this. And to my infinite despair, I discovered that I couldn't do it. I couldn't simply fix myself. And that was a deeply disappointing discovery, <laughs> to, put it, to put it mildly. And at that moment, a young woman whose striking red hair I'd admired from afar, um, then said to me, completely out of the blue, she said to me, are you a Christian? And I couldn't believe what a stupid thing that was to say. I just thought it was indescribably stupid. I just thought, what on earth is this girl talking about? I, what kind of thing is that to say to someone? I mean, are you a Christian? I mean, what on earth is she talking about? I mean, I was just totally baffled. And I was so kind of baffled, I didn't know what to say. So I just let her kind of chunter on and she kind of waffled on about stuff. And I thought, what on earth is this girl talking about? She's completely nuts. And then as she was kind of chantering on, obviously growing up as I did at that time, going to school in the 70s, I'd been told Bible stories throughout my primary school. So I knew the stories, as it were. You know, I'd, I'd been told them in the context of education. And I'd, you know, learned about Easter and Christmas, kind of, roughly. So I knew roughly what she was talking about. I just thought it was... I don't know, Disney or something, you know. 
And, and then this kind of thought came to mind. I thought, what if it's true? <laughs> And the idea of it being true suddenly became so beautiful and so extraordinary and so lovely that I just kind of fell in love. And I kind of fell in love with the truth. And from that moment on, I think I believed. I didn't know what I believed. I couldn't relate what this thing was to the stories I'd heard as a child. And that night, I went round to the local vicar's house. I got there about 10 at night and I banged on his door. <laughs> and um, I'd kind of, uh, my company at that time was, um, I don't know, when you're young and stupid, you mix with kind of young, stupid people. So. I was mixing with a, a group of uh, blokes known as the White Line Motorcycle Club. And um, they had formed an allegiance with the Compass Motorcycle Club, and we used to go and get off our faces at the pub called the Greyhound. And so this bloke turns up at the vicar's door, banging on his door at 10 at night from the White Line Motorcycle Club. So I was dressed, as you might expect, just like that, with leathers and everything else on. And the poor bloke kind of looked, oh my god, what's happening? <laughs> and. Um, and he said, and I said, I think I'm a Christian now, what do I do about it? He kind of went, of course. Cool. <laughs> um, he said, um, come to church. So I said, okay. And then he said, uh, read the Bible. So I said, all right then. But begin with the New Testament, he said. The Old Testament gets, you know, needs interpretation. Oh, okay, I said. So I went home and I just found a Bible and read the New Testament. And that Sunday I turned up to church, late. <laughs> and I continued to turn up to church, late, every Sunday. <laughs> and I still didn't know what he was talking about. I had no idea what this whole business was about. I just knew that this was beautiful and this was good and I believed in it. And gradually over the years it kind of drip, 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 the kind of understanding of it kind of unfolded and I gradually kind of got it and I could understand what all these people were talking about. So if any of you don't understand what it's all about, I do sympathise, I know where you're coming from. <laughs> but it was a kind of vision. And when I was trying to think how to make an analogy for this thing, of this, the transfiguration of Jesus, that's basically the only thing I could really think of. Because it, it's just a kind of vision. I mean, what else can you say? The, as Peter says, we, we did not follow cleverly d devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we have been eyewitnesses of his majesty. We saw it, he said. I was there, he said, on the mountain. I went up the mountain with him, and then there he was, shining like the sun. There's I mean, the various gospel accounts put it slightly differently. His garments shone like lightning, his face was dazzling white, he's blazed, you know. They're overwhelmed. And then it says this cloud descended on them. And then if you've read the Old Testament, you know that whenever the Lord's presence kind of rests somewhere, there's the cloud of the presence. You know, the, there's the darkness of creation. And then when Moses consecrated the tabernacle, the, you know, the first tent of meeting, there's the cloud came down from heaven and rested on it. When Solomon consecrated the temple, it says the cloud came down from heaven and filled it so no one could see what they were doing inside there. Someone once asked me, they said, what do you actually want? You know, what do you want as a vicar, as a priest? What are you kind of trying to do? I said, what I want, I want to see the cloud of the presence resting upon the Lord's people. That's what I want. And so that when Peter saw this cloud coming down, I mean, his hackles must have gone up. He must have thought, my God, you know, what's happening? This is like the old stories. This is like Solomon. This is like Moses. Because in this story, we read here about Moses going up the mountain and then the cloud came down and rested on the mountain and the blaze of his glory sort of shone out. 
Some people said it must have looked like a kind of volcano. And then Moses heard this voice from the cloud that said, come on up, Moses. And he went in and he just kind of disappeared into this cloud resting on the hilltop. And everyone sat there and watched and thought, where's Moses gone? And Joshua, son of Nun, his friend, just sort of sat there at the bottom of the mountain. He watched his mate sort of walk up and vanish. And he just sat there for 40 days, waiting for him. This came shortly after, it says, the Moses and the elders of Israel and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu had been invited up to take tea with God. It said he invited them up and it said they saw the Lord seated on a throne with like a sea of sapphire in front of him and they ate and drank in his presence. And then following that, Moses disappears into this cloud and then reappears 40 days later. And by that time, the Israelites have forgotten all about what God had said to them. They've made their golden calf, they'd had a party, got off their faces and done all kinds of silly things and Moses was really cross. But then there's another parallel kind of story with this where Elijah, having faced off the prophets of Baal at Mount Carmel, he made a challenge, if you remember, to the prophets of Baal and to the king and to the queen, Jezebel. He said, okay, he said, let us build two altars. We'll put our offerings on the altars and we'll both do our stuff. And whoever gets the offering of fire from heaven, whoever gets God responding by fire, that God is the real one. So the prophets of Baal said, yeah, okay, we're up for that, we'll do it. So they did it. And it said there were 400 prophets of Baal and they were dancing, they were singing, they were banging cymbals, clashing drums, they were gashing themselves, you know, making themselves bleed. That was part of their kind of worship and their sacrifice. Nothing happened. And after three and a half years of drought, when the country was scorched and the crops were dead and everyone was starving, Mo Elijah then said, let's get some water. And they went up onto this altar of 12 stones, he said, 12 rough rocks. He poured out water on top of the whole lot, on top of the wood, on top of the meat and everything, till the whole thing was completely drenched and there's a pool of water standing there. You can just imagine the psychological impact on that, and the country stricken with drought. That they sit there in this sort of haze of heat and dust and hunger, and they see this bloke just pouring water <laughs> out on this pile of rocks. And then the Lord said, and then Elijah just prayed, and the fire came down from heaven. And it didn't just come, it licked up the water, the, the meat, the wood, and cracked the rocks and everything. It wasn't a little spark. And then Jezebel said, I'm going to get you. And Elijah ran. And he ran, and he ran, and he ran. And he eventually got to Sinai. And the Lord said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah said, oh, he said, I'm worn out, I've had enough, I'm fed up. And he went up and he met the Lord in a cloud. And those two men, Moses and Elijah, were remarkable for not having a grave. Moses just disappeared on Mount Nebo before entering the land. And as it says in uh, Deuteronomy, no one knows to this day where his grave is. And Elijah was simply taken up to heaven. Elisha, his friend, saw him go. So the two of them were, if you like, the, sometimes called the deathless ones or the graveless ones. There's something mysterious about their end. But both of them had had this extraordinary experience of meeting the Lord and then being sent out for their purpose, somehow prepared by this meeting. And so Peter and James and John were invited by Jesus to go up with him on a mountain top. And Peter later recalls this, saying how he was there, he was a witness to this event. And then how they saw his face shone like the sun and his clothes became dazzling white. And there's a kind of inversion about this because in the other stories, Moses and Elijah went up and saw, met with God in some mysterious way, some unseen way, and then came back again. 
But Jesus didn't go and meet with God because he is the son of God. He is the revelation. It's almost saying as if Moses and Elijah went up in the cloud and this is what they saw. This is who they saw. They saw the Lord. They saw Jesus, the son of God. And when, Mo, when Peter says, I'm not inventing clever stories about all this stuff, he says, the reason I'm telling you that Jesus is the Son of God is because God told me. I didn't work it out. <laughs> I didn't kind of calculate it or infer it. He said, the Lord simply said, this is my Son. Listen to him. And then later on in life, he thought about the scriptures and he remembered this psalm, Psalm 2. You are my son, this day have I begotten you. You are the king, today I crown you. I will give you the nations for your inheritance, the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall crush them with an iron rod and shatter them with like a piece of pottery. And there's a kind of embarrassing line in one of these verses which is left out of the, the Psalter, funnily enough, and out of the NRSV translation. It says kind of embarrassingly in the second to last verse, kiss the sun and then it says lest he be angry and you perish and it's such an odd thing to say I mean it, it kind of sticks in that verse and you kind of think why is it saying kiss the sun but well it's obvious isn't it why it says kiss the sun the son of God the son of the living God embrace him welcome him because as it says in the last verse, happy are all they who take refuge in him. Happy are they who take refuge in him. And it's curious how they say it, kiss him, embrace him, welcome him, love him. Because he is the king, because he is the son of God, because he is your rightful ruler, he is your maker, your creator, and he is your redeemer. Therefore, welcome him, bless him, show him love. Because he is the one. He is the revelation. Moses and Elijah went looking for a sign. They went looking for the Lord, looking for revelation. They were invited to go up. Jesus is the revelation. He is what they were looking for. He is what they found. And John and Peter and James saw it with their own eyes. So they didn't have to work it out. They didn't have to calculate it or infer it. They didn't have to kind of interpret the scriptures to see what the prophets meant. It was simply there in front of them. They simply saw it. And then just in case they'd missed the point, the voice came from the cloud, this is my son. It wasn't exactly rocket science, is it? <laughs> Any moron could have understood that. But what could you do? You know, what do we do by way of response? And for me, when I was young, I just thought, I'm in love. This is truth, this is beauty, this is goodness, it's real. It's something which I can find. It's something which the Lord has shown me. It's something which is there. And ever since then, I've basically tried to be a Christian. Not any particular kind. I've tried to avoid being a particular kind. I've simply tried to be a Christian. And so I've carried on <laughs> trying to be a Christian. <laughs> because I think it's true. I think it's beautiful. I think it's good. And I think it all works. The story of Jesus is a historical story. It happened. And it harks back to the stories of Moses and Elijah, which I think are historical. I think they happened. And the prophets spoke in the Psalms, why are the nations in an uproar? Let us break their boat, they say, the rebelliousness against the, all the authorities, against the living God. And then it says, you are my son, this day have I begotten you, said the prophet. And then he said, kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish. Embrace him, welcome him, because he is your king and he is your saviour. He's the one who cares for you, actually. And it's not a cleverly designed myth, which we made known to you. But they were eyewitnesses. 
and the prophets have spoken. And so Peter says, you do well to be attentive to this as to a lamp shining in a dark place. Because it's not obviously true, this. And the world around us rebels against it, as the psalm says. But he says, this knowledge, this truth, can be like the morning star rising in your heart until the day dawns. Because, as Peter says, the Lord is coming again. And we, his people, are waiting for him. That is the gospel. Amen. So let's all say together the words of the Creed.